we we might kick off for everybody because um, I can see that there's more people joining us, but um, I think by the time we get through um, our introductions, uh, um, we um, uh, will be you know we'll have more people online, which is great. Um, and so um, yes, let's kick off. And I'd like to start by welcoming um, everybody online. Um, hello, and I know many people that I can see popping up saying hello, uh, but for those that don't know me, my name's Kate Lee. I'm the Executive Officer of Union Aid Abroad, AFIDA, uh, which for those that don't know what AFIDA is or who it is, it's the Global Justice Organisation of the Australian Union Movement, established in 1984 by the Australian Council of Trade Unions currently working um, in uh, projects across the Asia Pacific region, but also in the Middle East, in Palestine and Lebanon, and in Southern Africa, Zimbabwe and South Africa. So um, please be aware that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded later to the AFIDA YouTube channel. And we'll share that out also for people that can't attend today had a number of people apologise and ask if it is going to be recorded because they couldn't make this time. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging Aboriginal land. Um, I'm here today on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and we pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging and we recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. This will always be Aboriginal land. And we pay respects to all of you who are coming to us from Australia today on um, whatever Aboriginal land you are on, um, either in your workplace or at home. Uh, welcome today to this webinar, uh, which is the first of a number to come in future. Uh, this today's events will be looking at um, issues related to civil rights and labour rights, um, under the COVID crisis and in the era of COVID, uh, particularly focused on some countries in Southeast Asia. We have two speakers today and each will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes each and then we'll have time for questions. So I know quite a few of you and I know um, a few of you online have um, a wealth of experience. So I hope that you'll contribute with questions. After the questions, we also, um, uh, which we will invite you to um, submit in the chat. So as, I'm sorry, after the speakers, we'll invite you to um, ask questions in the chat, um, which will be collated by um, myself and some other AFIDA staff assisting today. And just so you know, all participants will be muted unless they're unmuted by one of us, um, in which case we'll throw to you to ask your question. Um, uh, as as um, those questions are um, assessed. If you want to comment further, we certainly welcome that and perhaps um, invite you to share comment or relevant links that you think um, involve good analysis of the issues that are being discussed today um, and share those into um, our event, uh, Facebook event page. Um, you're welcome to share them. I think you're able to into the chat um, if you want to, but certainly the, the event Facebook po uh, page is there, which has a more permanent um, uh, record. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be having some follow-up webinars on topics from across the broad work of AFIDA, and we'll keep you posted on those. We've also launched a COVID-19 appeal during this time, which will be financial support to assist unions and community organisations that we work with across the region in response to this crisis. Details of how to donate will be posted up in the chat. Um, please share this link through your networks. So on to our two guest speakers today. And I know that some of you know um, uh, both of our speakers or one of them. Debbie Stoddard is the coordinator of Alternative ASEAN Network on Burma, which is an NGO that was established in 1994 to advocate for democratic rights in Burma. Debbie is a long-term commentator on human rights issues across the Asia Pacific region. And she's also a former secretary general of FIDH, which is the global network of human rights NGOs. And our second speaker is Wulan Dari, currently the country manage manager for Myanmar um, for Unionate Abroad AFIDA 
and previously Regional Education Organiser for BWI in the Asia Pacific region. BWI is the uh, Global Union uh, Building and Woodworkers International. It's a global union that works with unions in the construction and woodworking industries. And prior to that, Wulan also worked with the Asia Monitoring Research Centre based in Hong Kong. So, um, without further ado, I'll ask Debbie to kick off our discussion today. And I think she's going to share a presentation as well. So, welcome Debbie, thanks for coming today. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Hi, um, thanks for having me. Hang on, can you hear me now? Yes. Oops. Yes. I we just realised I just realised that I should have scrolled back to the first page of my PowerPoint, <laughs> and here we are. Um, hang on. Are you seeing this? Not yet. No. Okay. Sorry. When we did it, this is really funny because when we did it, it, it worked okay. Uh, all right. Um, I have a slight problem here because my my PowerPoint has scrolled not to the first page. Let me try this again. Yes, here we are. Sharon. Um, um, hi, everyone, and really happy to see some familiar names and faces here. Uh, what I wanted to do was just to go through. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see it, Debbie. That's great. Okay, cool. Uh, so I just wanted to share a few points instead of just having a talking head. And, um, oh, it says my screen share is stopped. Okay, now it is. This is crazy. Um, but basically, COVID-19, the pandemic, and how it's... Um, um, how it's, uh, uh, the responses have been formulated are really uh, exposing how fouled up the whole system is, all the gaps and all the weaknesses of the, 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 the violence, the inequalities and injustices of the global capitalist system is actually becoming so exposed now. Um, uh, are you seeing a, a, a slide with a tuk-tuk on it? Yes, we are. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'm just testing. So what what we are seeing is that uh, the I think whether it's in Brisbane or Bangkok or anywhere any part of the world, people who were urban poor, indigenous, displaced, migrants, asylum seekers, women, people in the informal sector have become more vulnerable, and we've also seen now um, um, uh, middle class and other working class people who have been who've joined the gig economy or become contractors uh, do, using doing contract work for their livelihood are now even more vulnerable as well. But also we've started to see that people are at a heightened risk of violence, harassment and extortion um, and workspaces, public spaces and at home. And the and particularly when we talk about domestic violence, it, a lot of it is affecting women and children at home. But um, even in Thailand, which is a relatively rich country in the region, we're starting to see cases where people are actually killing themselves out of despair because um, they're just unable to cope financially. They're not able to get access to very basic social services and protections. And this is um, an example of how the economic boom in Southeast Asia and East Asia failed and uh, refused to take into account the need for social protections because there was, it was always assumed that our economy will be so uh, will be growing at such a pace that the trickle-down effect would protect people at the grassroots, but it actually hasn't. And the um, the COVID pandemic is um, is exposing that reality in a very dramatic way. Excuse me, Debbie. Can you just put your um, your PowerPoint on full screen so it's more visible? Thank you. Okay, I'm just trying to do that. Uh, hang on. I've got very funny windows coming up. Okay, can you see it better? Okay. Um, I'm trying to put this onto... I think okay. you, you might need to go to slideshow. There you go. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I was trying to go to slideshow. Anyway, um, in, in, we've already seen many cases of hate speech and racist violence happening in countries of the North, including in Australia. 
And we're also seeing that racism and that violence uh, express, manifested in Asia in the form of um, not against Asians, of course, um, but actually against migrants and asylum seekers. In Malaysia, we saw a spike in anti-Rohingya hate speech, a Rohingya being the, um, the uh, Muslim minority group in Burma facing genocide. And Malaysia is one of the countries that received many boat, Rohingya boat people. And now they're being uh, demonized for um, uh, uh, being infected by, by COVID. Um, and when the government, uh, uh, when the government uh, promised not to criminalize people who sought medical treatment or got themselves tested for COVID, uh, people breathe a sigh of relief. But then on May Day, on Labor Day itself, the uh, Malaysian authorities went on a massive crackdown and they continue to do so to round up so-called illegal migrants um, under the guise of protecting the population from COVID infection. In Northeast India, the uh, indigenous groups there um, are, uh, appear to be more East Asian in appearance and they've been um, subjected to being spat in the face and being called COVID and being harassed in the street and in public spaces by uh, mainstream Indians. In um, Burma, Myanmar, we're seeing that people are really, pe people who used to rely to survive out of the remittances of migrant workers from China and from Thailand uh, are now seeing some of the many migrant workers returning and there's a great deal of fear about them potentially bringing virus into the country. All around we've seen quite serious and denial of services and that has extended to migrants also. Uh, being very, very afraid to even seek food, to go out and seek food because we're seeing more checkpoints sprouting up all over our capital cities. So um, people are afraid of being arrested and dragged away by the cops or the military. And, then, and, and so many of them are starving and not seeking any kind of assistance. And these are not just adult migrants. These are also the children and the, the young dependents of these migrants. Mm -hmm. um, I think if it's a one big lesson learned for us, it's understanding and realizing the massive harm that corporate capture has, um, um, has caused to all our economies globally, and particularly so in Asia, where the link between political um, parties and corporations is very, very strong. And so... Um, we, we've seen uh, uh, a privatization of social services or um, a skewing of resources to economic and profit opportunities for corporations and crony businesses. And this is why we are start, uh, when, when, when we, were, we were shocked at how slow it took the Indonesian government to start uh, measures in Jakarta, which is one of the densest populated cities in the region. They, the, the Jakarta was very slow in trying to imp uh, impose social distancing and other health, public health precautions. And people were asking why, and it's very clear, many, gov many businesses didn't want business to shut down in Jakarta. And they saw that the people most likely to die from it were actually the urban poor. So I think um, there was an assumption that somehow rich corporations and rich business people would be insulated from COVID-19 in Jakarta. Um, and, I, I, and I saw many Indonesian activists being very frustrated and angry at the slowness of the government measure because um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a densely populated city like Jakarta. But I think the lesson learned for all of us is we do need to combat corporate capture of uh, policy um, development and economics in the country. And uh, we need to uh, be able to grab high international level
equality and human rights, who very, in, in his first uh, few days of the mandate measures globally for making us less capable or less able to, to um, the pandemic. So when we are looking forward, we need to understand that the stimulus packages, the recovery plans, all of that, we do need to combat corporate capture in that process and make it more transparent and open and people-centered. Um, we've also started to see uh, in many countries how governments were very quick to strengthen militarization and securitization under the cover of COVID-19 responses. And in places like Indonesia, in Philippines, for example, we saw a public humiliation of LGBT uh, people who were uh, suspected or caught um, breaching um, the pub, pub curfew. They were actually publicly humiliated and forced to perform sexual acts as public humiliation. So that harassment is there. We also have received report, we've seen reports of um, uh, poorer urban women being forced to uh, provide sexual favors or pay money because they were trying to get through a police checkpoint to go to work or to do uh, business. So we, we're seeing that harassment increase in some cases. And um, of course, in Burma, Myanmar, which is a country that takes up most of my focus, uh, we were quite shocked when one of my researchers, Dan, revealed, he said, did you realize that in the first month after WHO declared the pandemic, there were 80 military attacks affecting civilians in four states across Western and Northern Burma, Myanmar. That's 80 attacks in which civilians were affected in one month in one country. And uh, uh, just last week, the military of the country dismantled um, COVID-19 um, screening um, huts organized by the Karen National Union to try and screen people who were entering their area for fever and symptoms of COVID-19. And um, that actually sparked more fighting in that area. So we're seeing this very uh, clear relationship, the intersection between how the militarization and securitization of COVID-19 responses has actually uh, caused an increase or escalation in armed conflict. But um, all around, whether you're in China, in Malaysia, in Myanmar, and elsewhere, um, we've already seen a, a, a significant um, harassment of human rights defenders and media. And he, some of these human rights and defenders and media are not only um, exposing or questioning government, government um, incompetence uh, in COVID responses, but also exposing other ongoing crimes and human rights violations. For example, in Indonesia, we've had a journalist arrested because um, he was exposing uh, uh, um, indigenous res uh, reserve. People also fail to notice is that Indonesia is proceeding with development of the world's largest oil palm plantation. So um, all of these, and, and, and we've been noticing even in uh, Australia, the government has been dismantling uh, environmental protections and uh, passing or um, permitting um, uh, per permitting projects that are going to cause serious, long, uns uh, serious irreversible harm to the environment and to people's health. So we do need to understand what's going on in Australia is going on in other parts of the region. And that's why we have a common cause. Um, we need to find, we need to keep on the energy we need to understand that this is not the, the COVID-19 pandemic is not going to be the only pandemic that we will experience in the years ahead. There will be more pandemics and impacts will intersect with the impacts of climate change. 
So we need to understand and take a holistic approach that the protections of communal and would actually reinforce the protections that would protect us against pandemics. We need to keep on doing what we're doing. We need to actually accelerate and bring more energy into visioning, advocating for and implementing a sustainable and just global future. We need to ensure that corporate, there's no more, we need to we need to oppose corporate capture of recovery packages and policies. Um, we need to include the invisible. One of the things that we are mindful of the Zoom format is that um, this actually allows the inclusion of the participation of engaging including in conflict areas who can't join this. So we need to find ways to ensure they are included. And your solidarity counts. And um, if you haven't been spending money, not good, and spending money buying cafe lattes and cappuccinos, use that money, you know, donate it to the um, FIDA COVID appeal so that it can be used to that we need to also be really concerned about is our self-care. Many people have been, we call it zoomed out. We are pretty much zoomed out because we've been putting our energy into this and it is depressing to look at the statistics and to hear more news about how messed up the situation is. So we need to find resources for us to maintain and feed our rage, our creativity and our energy in addressing the human rights challenges we've always been that we need to do it, don't give Okay. Um, thank you, Debbie. Um, sorry, your internet was cutting in and out a little bit, but we certainly heard 95% of what you said, but it did cut in and out a little bit. I think you've reached the end of your presentation, but just let me know if that's not the case, but I'm pretty sure that was your last slide. Can everyone else hear me online? Is that still working? I assume it is. Yes. Great, good. Um, Debbie, did you, uh, you just, your screen froze a little bit then. Did you hear what I just said, said just in closing then? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I saw there was a little signal that said your yes, internet is unstable and that was really horrifying. But um, I think we all had a, a good plan to do a backup with the screen share. Yeah, yeah that's right. Great. We certainly got the, the, the vast bulk of what you were saying. Uh, Debbie. Oh, and, and I hope what didn't fall out was the fact that I said that material support and solidarity was important. And the money that we saved on cappuccinos and cafe lattes really should go to the AFIDA COVID-19 appeal. <laughs> Good on you. Thank you for that endorsement. Yes, we heard that bit. Um, and I think Jared's posted the link in the chat as well. Um, look, thanks so much, Debbie, for giving us that very quick overview. Uh, there is so much in that. I know I've received at least one question directly to you, which we'll come back to after we hear from Wulan. So I'd just like to remind everybody that please submit your questions um, in the chat um, and we'll come back to questions after we hear from our second speaker uh, today. Um, so I introduced um, Wulan at the beginning. Uh, but just briefly again, Wulandari is our um, country manager based usually in Myanmar, um, in Yangon, but currently she's uh, in Indonesia. So she is coming to us to give us a bit of an overview around the labour rights issues and questions currently in both Myanmar and Indonesia and projecting a bit to the future as well, um, what we need to do in, um, in relation to our efforts um, in both those countries into the future. So over to you, Wulan, and hopefully your e um, internet will be stable too. So I think we've got the second- yeah, hopefully, can, can you all hear me now? Yes, okay. We can. Um, I think you've missed the okay. first slide, so you might want to go back to that. 
your first slide. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh dear. So yeah, uh, I will start my presentation. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a very framing. Uh, I would like to say it's a very typical of a neoliberal crisis. But this time is a way more complex than before. So there are things that always uh, happen in this crisis that the workers uh, suffer the most, and the state uh, bailing out the private sector, and then uh, to uh, overcome the financial uh, crisis. Then uh, there's a loan from international financial institutions, so more debt coming in uh, some uh, country. As Debbie mentioned uh, earlier, so basically this is a sort of like a nightmare coming through of all these uh, austerity uh, measures, privatization of the healthcare and privatization of the social uh, service. Uh, my presentation will uh, focus on the unions uh, responding on COVID, uh, crisis, also the impact of uh, COVID on uh, uh, workers' rights in uh, Myanmar and also a bit about uh, Indonesia. And I think there are some colleagues from Indonesia joining the uh, so webinar. Then the uh, letter can add uh, in the discussion. Hello, can everyone still hear? Yes, yes, go me. Yep. Oh, okay, okay. So we, we, we start uh, with, the, with the Myanmar. Uh, it's a country that's uh, a bit late in, uh, in uh, identifying the case of COVID-19. But even before that, it's already severely hit by uh, COVID-19 that uh, since December and the end of April, that at least around uh, 175 cases of the operation. And then uh, uh, after Barbie's uh, New Year, the government issued an instruction to temporarily uh, shut down all the facts for the inspection to uh, inspect whether the police met all the safety standards to contain the COVID-19 outbreak at the, at the factory. And then so the, the shutdown period is uh, between April 20 to April 30, and then now it's extended to May uh, 15. And uh, if this is a uh, continued, like uh, at least uh, 60,000 registered factories in Myanmar, they uh, will face irreversible uh, damage. Uh, I mean, they will lose all the profit and they might have to slow down their uh, operation for uh, many years uh, after this. And then also uh, we need to remember that 83% of Myanmar or uh, 18 million workers, they are in the informal workers. And then with all this uh, called uh, semi-lockdown in Myanmar, uh, their jobs, their daily income, especially the construction uh, sector. And then also in a, there is an issue of the shortage of uh, raw material that has uh, happened uh, since uh, December uh, last year. So that's the outlook of uh, Myanmar. So I, I will start with the outlook of uh, Myanmar, Indonesia, and then the union response and what kind of uh, international uh, solidarity uh, that we could uh, develop uh, further. So um, in March, there's already tripartite uh, dialogue uh, on this uh, uh, COVID-19 Minister of uh, Labor. And then uh, on April 7th, the minister uh, of the official COVID-19 uh, tripartite committee with the engagement of the trade unions and the uh, uh, employers uh, association. Uh, the thing is that all this COVID pandemic crisis uh, happened in the middle of the dialogue of the minimum wage uh, setting in Myanmar. So in Myanmar, the minimum wage is set in uh, once in uh, every two years. So this year, uh, the minimum wage should be uh, increased and it should be, uh, and the new minimum wage should be enforced in uh, March. But of course, it did not happen because of this uh, crisis. And then, uh, in the beginning of uh, March, uh, there was a sort of like a, a 
it's very like uh, it's not really a commitment but there was a discussion in the tripartite that the new minimum wage uh, likely uh, will be enforced in September but then after Burmese New Year we have not heard anything uh, anymore about this uh, minimum wage uh, issue so it's a uh, it's a uh, delayed but then uh, one point that I would like to uh, highlight, uh, because it's related to Indonesia omnibus law uh, later on. Uh, in the middle of the which that Myanmar in January, the uh, approved the amendment of the minimum wage law. This amendment uh, stipulates that uh, the minimum wage, uh, the minimum wage, should not be uh, fixed in a, in a certain period of time. It can be uh, fixed any time, depending on the negotiation between employers and uh, and the workers. So it's sort of like a liberalization of a uh, wage in a, in a Myanmar. The the thing is that uh, many factories, I mean, the university in Myanmar is very low, on only like zero point six uh, percent, and then it reflects the low uh, bargaining. Uh, position of, of the workers. So all these things uh, happen within the January and February while workers are coping with the factories uh, closure and, uh, and everything. And then now uh, there is a delay uh, uh, regarding this uh, minimum wage uh, issues. Um, of course, uh, garment sector is uh, severely uh, hit in, uh, in Myanmar. Uh, and then uh, well, <laughs> there's a common. Uh, I mean, I mean, there's already some uh, global initiative uh, developed to uh, overcome this uh, crisis in the in the garment sector. Like, for instance, like uh, encouraging bipartite dialogue, and also to push uh, the brands to pay the manufacturer to finish the production, and also for the brand to. Uh, to keep paying the suppliers until uh, end of our contract. And also, if possible, brands to provide uh, direct uh, for the factories and supplier to pay the workers. But this is a very immediate uh, solution, you know, just like uh, also EU, they have already set up a global fund in Myanmar to compensate uh, work for three months wages. But it's all an uh, immediate solution, but the question that we need to be discussed later then, what would happen after this three to uh, six months? Yeah, I mean, we get in later on. That's the outlook of uh, Myanmar. Uh, and then, is it okay still I can... Uh, yes, yeah, it's hello. fine. Um, Wulan, it's fine. Yeah, okay, okay. Your internet right, goes okay. in and out a little bit, but it's okay. Just keep keep yeah. moving, moving, moving forward. Thank you. Okay, so now that's the outlook of Myanmar. So now, if you look at uh, Indonesia, uh, workers uh, have been uh, impacted by this uh, COVID nineteen. Like one point six uh, million workers they have been uh, for off. So they they they. Company said it's a temporary yeah, reinstated, and then uh, Indonesia is anticipating 2.9 to 5.2 job uh, losses. Yes, uh, outbreak. Um, so what happened? So uh, <laughs> since uh, last quarter of uh, of uh, last year, and then also early this year. There's this uh, contracted omnibus law, which is uh, basically intended to uh, simplify all the procedure and uh, regulation uh, for uh, investment in Indonesia. And also the basic intention is that uh, there are so many barriers for a uh, lab intensive uh, industry in Indonesia. Like uh, before, uh, with the with the investment regulation that uh, Indonesia has, it could only accommodate the creation of a job for uh, two hundred uh, thousand uh, workers uh, in a, in an annual uh, basis. But then, how to double the the job uh, creation? So that's the the main intention of the bill. So actually, 
this omnibus law is a compilation of all kind of law and regulation into into one uh, law and then there is this uh, content labor provision uh, uh, within this bill, yeah, and then this con is, it is very contested because it uh, actually it uh, promotes a further uh, fle flexibilized uh, labor uh, relation, like it introduces the unlimited duration of a contract and also potential uh, changes of uh, wage uh, system and also reduction of uh, severance payment and also a reduction of uh, rights uh, to leave um, again it's it's a, it's a pro it's not only it promotes a flexibilization of a, of a labor relation but also some areas are liberalized like a wage uh, negotiation and also a uh, contract issues and uh, if we look at the labor code which uh, was just introduced in uh, Vietnam there are also some similarity regarding this uh, flexibilization of a uh, uh, contract uh, of uh, of labor so this pandemic happened uh, and also in the same time uh, many southeast asian countries the labor law in southeast asian countries are uh, moving uh, forward yeah, toward the further uh, flexibilization of a uh, uh, of a labor and also further li liberalization or deregulation yeah of a, of a, of a regulatory uh, framework so it's a <laughs> Multi challenge is a, is a double uh, challenge that uh, we are uh, facing here. Um, of course, uh, with this uh, pandemic, uh, the, the the discussion of or, or the passage of this uh, labor provision in the in the omnibus law uh, is uh, was uh, delayed uh, last month uh, because the government said they just wanted to wait for another uh, round of a stakeholder uh, discussion. So uh, it was a uh, delay in, uh, in April. So that's the outlook of uh, Myanmar and then uh, Indonesia. Um, of course, for the government measure from Indonesia, there is uh, some budget uh, allocated for the healthcare, social protection, and also tax incentive for credit and, uh, and business. And then, yeah, I mean, everywhere, including Myanmar and Indonesia, in uh, when it comes to uh, practice it's a bit uh, chaotic because i think these two countries i mean like others are not really uh, ready in the in dealing with this uh, pandemic uh, crisis okay so um wait how to okay so i mean let's go to the point of uh, of uh, discussion after this uh, uh, outlook of these uh, two countries um once there is discussion, internal discussion in Afida, but it's very interesting uh, discussion that uh, uh, encourage us to assess uh, the field uh, situation. It's uh, it's uh, regarding the effectiveness of uh, alternating the production line by producing uh, PPEs and healthcare uh, facilities. Okay, yes, for uh, Myanmar, uh, the government has uh, made a commitment that uh, four factories. Uh, we would produce, uh, would start producing face mask, and also um, there is there is already one uh, healthcare uh, factory in Myanmar, but it's uh, the product is for uh, to, uh, to be exported to Hong Kong. But then now the government uh, and the factory had an agreement that they could buy this uh, healthcare product for the domestic uh, market. So basically, this is not alternating the production line; it's just a new arrangement between this. Uh, Myanmar government and this uh, factory. For Indonesia, yes, yeah, some national owned textile company they start uh, producing uh, PPEs and then also uh, fast masks. But then we, um, I mean, this bring us to uh, different uh, issues like. Uh, in alternating the production lines, it requires the availability of a raw material and also a government to government uh, arrangement and then also a certain level of the workers skill. I mean, if we uh, review the the, G, the recent G20 meeting, like there is a sort of like a 
potential uh, new job division among countries yeah in this uh, pandemic uh, crisis on who uh, producing what and then who will uh, supply the raw material and then who will uh, provide the fund we don't know how this uh, will go in the in the future whether there will be a new international job division whether it will uh, lead to a new uh, trade uh, agreement or how this thing uh, will uh, intersect with the existing uh, trade uh, agreement is there maybe we should have a discussion because we are completely against the all the existing uh, trade agreement but then now this pandemic crisis uh, we all have to uh, work uh, together, but of course not in a in a in a context of capitalism, but more in a context of uh, solidarity. This is what we uh, need uh, to discuss uh, further. So, um, yeah, Wulan, just to uh, remind you, about five more minutes for you, Wulan, and then okay. we'll have a question. Okay. Thanks. Yes, and then. Uh, <laughs> What about the union's uh, strategy? What possible uh, 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 strategy that could be uh, developed by the union? First, uh, this is based on the on the field situation uh, in uh, in Myanmar and also a bit about uh, from Indonesia that it is important for the union to start expanding the organizing scope, reaching out former members who just lost their jobs during this. Uh, crisis and potentially become informal workers because we don't know when the when the manufacturer sector will uh, revive again will uh, rebound again so the unions uh, this is not a new discourse but they they have to start uh, thinking uh, about this and uh, especially in a in a Myanmar it's very important for the union to seize the opportunity uh, uh, in the in the COVID-19 uh, uh, tripartite dialogue basically this is a sort of like a local effort how to influence the policy making uh, at the local level this policy making that will affect the employers uh, behavior uh, at the national level and also a cross-sector alliance that could shape bargaining power at the grassroots level it's a very uh, important, like for instance, uh, the unions working together with the farmer group to ensure the sustainability of uh, of uh, food during this uh, crisis. Yeah. Um, so, what about the international uh, solidarity? I think the uh, pand pandemic has uh, reshaped uh, many things, including uh, cross border and uh, labor mobility in uh, in a general. And Debbie has uh, mentioned a bit about the migration. So um, let's talk about this cross-border or our universal social protection, universal wage uh, system and healthcare, and also uh, social contract uh, as a part of a discussion on the alternative uh, supply chain and then uh, due diligence. So um, let's, I mean, let's start something with something uh, feasible and, and then uh, possible, yeah, like we can uh, review the global uh, framework agreement or any kind of uh, regulation either at the local or uh, national or you know at the at the global level which part of the political negotiation between investor and government that we can uh, influence to push for the for the uh, social uh, contract and i think also it's important for the activists uh, at the global level uh, need to set up sort of like a monitoring system for initiatives such as like uh, erasing the debt or a global fund initiative that all this initiative would not further legitimize uh, autocratic uh, autocratic uh, regime yeah and also um, this is basically uh, similar to what Debbie said uh, it's about the corporate uh, culture but let's do uh, something concrete to denounce this uh, culture yeah let's revisit again these uh, companies uh, having a scandal regarding tax haven and how to pull out this fund for a Universal social protection, universal uh, healthcare, as such. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Wulan. Uh, that's great. And, and thanks also to John there, who was providing a little bit of translation of um, the posters as we went, which was great. Thank you, John. Okay. Look, thanks, Debbie and Wulan. Um, lots there uh, to talk about. So we'll have a little bit of time now. Uh, we're going to finish right on four o'clock and keep to time. Um, so I'm going to, we've got some good questions there. Um, I'm gonna to throw to Jafar first. He had a question to Debbie specifically about um, uh, what's happening in Thailand. So Jafar, would you like to start? 
and uh, ask your question about Thailand? Sure, sure. Um, hi, Debbie. How are you going? I hope you're all right. Thanks. Thanks very much for hopefully being able to answer this. Um, I've been doing a bit of reading and sort of trying to keep in touch on what's going on in our region um, throughout Asia. And one thing that stuck out to me was um, around Thailand's 5,000 baht a month supplement. So I had a couple of questions around that because I didn't really understand it. And a lot of the sources I could find were in Thai, which I don't speak or know how to read, unfortunately. So um, I hear basically the government's claiming that they're using a digital system which essentially precludes informal workers and a lot of others um, from the t 5,000 baht uh, per month supplement that they're doing. Um, do you think that's a deliberate decision by the government? And really importantly, what are millions of people in, in that situation doing to survive that aren't getting that supplement? Um, good question. Uh, the, uh, your, your reading is actually probably more than mine. But at this point, because there's been a, quite a few um, cases of suicide um, um, over people frustrated that they couldn't get uh, the supplement, the 5,000 baht supplement, which incidentally, it's something like uh, uh, $200 Australian a month. Um, so, which is not very much, especially if you're in Bangkok or Chiang Mai, the big cities. So um, there's been a bit of a pushback and um, there's been assurances that somehow they will try uh, to address the needs of people at the ground. But this is actually um, the fundamental structural failure of the whole system because uh, all our economies are built on the back of informal workers and migrant workers, and they have actually been excluded from these protections. It may not have been intentional, but it is a serious gap. So um, what we're seeing is NGOs and, um, human, and um, labor rights defenders trying to um, uh, help informally and trying to organize at the local level. Um, and that goes back also to a previous question about what are NGOs and union, uh, unions and uh, labor organizers doing. And uh, what we're seeing is that whether it's in Malaysia where people are actually um, finding ways to uh, negotiate their ways around um, the restrictions to deliver aid directly, um, the the Thai system actually was quite good on paper because it actually allows the government to pay money directly to people rather than the US system, which was basically routing funds to true corporations. So um, we just need to actually push the authorities to get outside of their comfort zone and find ways to um, to make sure that the informal workers are able to have access to those services. I think um, if you look at the problem of humanitarian aid, even trends in humanitarian aid where um, international NGOs are self-congratulating for giving credit cards to refugees and displaced people, this, this actually reinforces some of the fundamental social gaps within the society, within the home. And, and, um, and assume certain things about people's access to information and to movement. So I think we do need to think quite seriously about that. But what is exciting is that in places like Burma, there are civil society groups who are providing aid, who are providing information, because the government was, the government was very slow to do that, especially in ethnic minority and rural areas. Um, there, one of the groups that we work with even set up a, a quarantine zone for returning workers so that they could uh, have a safe quarantine rather than be forced to stay with overcrowded, in overcrowded homes with, other, with their families. So there are people and there are groups who are being very innovative and very concerned and very engaged. And they're doing it for very little resources. So we do need to make sure that the resources get out uh, to them. Um, and we need to differentiate between relief and actually fundamental change. And this is something that it, we have to be mindful of, that when we're talking about fundamental change, we're talking about a system that is manifested itself not just in Asia, but also in Australia and other parts of the world.
Thank, thanks, yeah. Debbie. Thanks for that. Um, I might let someone else ask a question now, but maybe um, if I could get your email contact and follow up. Sorry, I didn't get to catch when I was in Bangkok last time. That'd be great. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Jeffa. Um, look, um, you've answered a little bit of, I was going to throw to Michael Naylor, who had a question about good examples of unions, NGOs working to provide support and advocacy to migrant workers. You've answered that in part. So I'm going to ask Wulan if she might like to respond to that question. And then a couple of questions have asked about the impact on women workers in particular. So perhaps maybe I can throw to you, Wulan, for any further good examples of support to migrant workers that you've heard of in Indonesia and Myanmar, and also talk about the impact of women workers in either country as well. Okay. Hmm. Well, <laughs> I, um, I have not heard a more effective, uh, I, mean the, I mean, for uh, migrant workers, uh, the situation is, uh, it's just uh, very uh, bad, I would say, because uh, like, for example, in Thailand, at first the government say they would give an amnesty for the, for the migrant workers whose visa uh, is expired, but there is no clarity about the regulation. So we, um, we witness uh, thousands of migrant workers flock in, into the border because they are scared. They could not access uh, basic needs during the lockdown in a, in a Thailand yeah, before uh, Burmese New Year and there is no uh, quarantine uh, facilities uh, provided. And just like Debbie said, in Myanmar, in the end, it's a, it's a civil society group or an activist, they come up with the initiative to uh, provide a shelter uh, for uh, Myanmar migrant workers. But again, uh, it's another uh, exposed to a reality. For example, the migrant workers coming back from China to Kachin State it really exposed the illegal workers' uh, recruitment in a, in a Kachin uh, state that nobody uh, could be held responsible to uh, take care of these uh, migrant workers. Yeah, there is, in the end, there is a, a, a quarantine uh, facility provided by the government, but it's very uh, basic and also not uh, sufficient. And it uh, encouraged a more discussion in Myanmar about this illegal uh, workforce uh, agency in a Kachin state that uh, bringing in the migrant uh, workers uh, to China. But of course, in, a, in a Thailand, uh, I think like in Thai Burma uh, border, uh, Afida's uh, partner, they uh, like a map right, radio and also this uh, uh, migrant workers, uh, Mekong workers uh, network, Sanjeev knows this uh, group, they, they also uh, channel uh, Red Cross aid for, for, the, for the construction workers who get uh, stuck in, a, in, a, in Thailand, especially in, in a Phuket or a, in, a, in a certain part of, of the Thailand during uh, COVID-19. Yeah, and also I think the uh, radio campaign is uh, very uh, useful for the migrant workers, but useful in a sense just to let them know how to access a very uh, basic and uh, sufficient uh, resources. So, um, yeah, that's what I can answer to that uh, question, Kat. We have not uh, witnessed a very uh, effective uh, aid or assistance uh, for uh, migrant workers during this crisis. Of, I, mean, I mean, of course, there are many uh, civil groups, uh, they are proactive, uh, like I said before, like, like in Myanmar, providing a quarantine for the migrant workers. But yeah, that, that's just all, uh, I mean, this is what uh, I would like to add. Uh, maybe, maybe we can work on a something on a, on a regional basis uh, on this. Like for example, there is an MOU between Thailand and Myanmar and also MOU between Thailand and Laos and MOU between Thailand and then uh, Vietnam. I think uh, I had a bit discussion with Debbie in Myanmar in, a, in a March 2018. Uh, but this MOU, it's very like a standard about the employment contract and then the, the period uh, these migrant workers could stay in, in a Thailand and then when they have to go back again and then you know, but there is no any uh, regulation about when this pandemic happened, what about the coverage of uh, social uh, protection? And where the migrant, uh, wherever the mine, you know, the migrant workers, they have to pay for the social uh, security and also, uh, uh, sorry, they have to pay for health insurance to, to workforce agencies before they are being deployed in Thailand. But see, in this situation, where is the money? You know, and then both uh, government, like, 
they they don't know how to take care of this uh, uh, return or how to anticipate uh, the the return. So I think this is something that we can uh, work on as well on the regional basis. Let's review again this MOU of uh, migrant uh, workers in a, in a Mekong uh, countries. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a concrete thing that we can uh, do and then develop uh, further. The impact on, on the women, of course, for uh, Myanmar and also Indonesia, especially textile and uh, garment. In Myanmar, 90% of uh, textile and garment workers, they are uh, women uh, workers. They are uh, impacted in, a, in a many ways. And then the, the scariest part is a, is a debt trap. Yeah, they, they, uh, because they have to pay uh, bills. Yeah, they have to pay uh, for the uh, for the hostel rent. They have to pay uh, for the food and everything. So, um, well, I would say in the, in the future, if they if they do not have work, there is no choice. But they will be, uh, they will be uh, they will engage themselves. They will marketize themselves in a, in a informal economy but already we have a complex uh, situation for example of uh, human trafficking like a forced marriage like many uh, Burmese uh, women uh, were keep, uh, what is it offer the job in China but actually uh, they are trapped in, a, in a either a sort of like become a sex worker or a forced marriage uh, in China so yeah there's a severe impact on the, on these uh, women uh, workers so far uh, they are covered by this uh, okay there is this as i mentioned earlier there is this uh, global fund set up by eu called miangku targeting uh, women workers losing their jobs at the garment and textile but they, but this is sort of like a cash aid so they compensate 3 to 6 month wages for the women workers who lost their jobs in the, in the garment and textile uh, factories the problem, again, Debbie, I agree with you, this exposes a lot of uh, reality, you know. The problem is that many workers, they do not have ID card. They are recruited uh, uh, in, a, in a very uh, casual uh, manner to work in the, in the factory. Even though now Afida and partner try to set up tracking mechanism, but this also gives us uh, a lot of thought on what to do uh, in the in the future uh, the protection of women not only confined uh, to the protection in the in the workplace is it, is already something that we are doing and it's difficult to achieve uh, how the woman is fully protected from sexual harassment and violence at the workplace mm -hmm. but there are also other things that we need to work on you know the, the casualization of work, the casual uh, recruitment process the fact that women in Myanmar many they do not have a ID card it means they could not access uh, public uh, facilities and also uh, a lot of uh, service. Even they cannot access this uh, compensation uh, scheme because they do not have a ID card. So yeah, it's a grim uh, situation, I would say. Okay, thanks, Wulan. Look, um, we're nearly at four, but we're going to just throw to Tim Diamond, who's um, he put a couple of questions, so maybe Tim, you can just choose one, and um, and maybe uh, Debbie and Wulan, whoever wants to respond, or both of you, just in terms of a brief response. Thanks, Tim. Okay, Tim is from thanks. our WA activist group. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, look, great talk from both of you. Um, something I was interested in, um, to some extent, it's been answered in the comments, but I'll ask it anyway. It was about uh, mention of trade agreements. Um, specifically, I wanted to know whether uh, trade unionists, activists like yourself feel, is the problem with trade agreements uh, that they don't contain labour and social protections? Or do you have a problem with the whole idea full stop? Um, and you just want, and you know, no, you just don't want them. Not at all. That's it. So, uh, yes, whoever wants to answer. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Anyone want to take that one on in terms of a short, brief answer, if you can? Debbie <laughs> first, and then I'll I just wanted to say that trade agreements are very, very vilified and very hated because of what they contain. And maybe 
uh, the potential for trade agreements to work uh, for us and for to be helpful is actually to ensure that trade agreements guarantee social protections and labor rights. And this is something that's been part of a very long-term struggle. It is, um, if we are able to transform trade agreements and investment protection agreements to protect the people rather than corporate interests, then we have something good going. Absent trade agreements, we still have a problem because there's no way to regulate or no way to com compel um, producers, factories, and um, corporations to comply with some of the most basic um, um, arrangements. But finally, we, do need, we, we need to understand that trade agreements and investment agreements must be um, must not trump or must not offset um, international and global um, core labor standards. And this is where we need to focus most of our attention on to ensure that FTAs and IPAs um, comply with core labor standards and that these core labor standards are expanded to take into account the reality um, that women, migrants, and urban poor are mainly in the informal sector and need to be protected. Okay. All right. We might just leave it there, if that's okay, Wulan, because I'm conscious we are, we said we'd finish at four and we've gone just over four. Um, so, and I just want to sort of acknowledge the many other questions in the Q&A section. Um, fantastic questions from so many of you who I know are, are actively looking and watching and reading what's happening internationally. Um, things like, you know, questions about... Um, universal payments in Indonesia, the prospects for workers' parties in, in countries in our region, specific questions about what's happening around displaced people in Rakhine State and Chin State in Myanmar, um, what kind of other trade union strategies would help support and protect people, how we organise in informal economy sectors, um, and, you know, the impact of remittances from migrant workers home who are unable to take those incomes back to their home countries, questions about the supply chain and how we organise um, effectively. So, so many good questions. I'm really sorry that we haven't been able to get to all of them today, but it's given us some good thoughts about future um, webinars that perhaps we can have more dedicated to some of these topics. And so I'd like to, again, uh, thank all of our participants um, for joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you for your great questions and your thinking about this. Thank you to Debbie and to Wulan uh, for their presentations. Really thought-provoking helps us think more about how we position to fight for um, global justice in our region. And I know everyone on this line is fully committed to that. So um, thanks again to the AFIDA team who helped support this, Jared, Emma, Katie, um, and um, thank you again to all of you. Um, we'll finish up there and we'll look forward to um, seeing you at a future um, webinar. This recording will be on our YouTube channel. So when we circulate it, please share it to people that you know will be interested in your networks. Thank you everybody and good afternoon.